Day 10 of 12 days through Second Chronicles. Today we read of godly King Hezekiah and of his enormous reforms in Israel to re-establish the right worship of Yahweh in his kingdom. And so there's not any particular verse that I'm going to read to you today, but I want to comment on the process Hezekiah went through to restore the life, the pulsating life of God and the worship of God in his kingdom. Hezekiah was obviously working from a really low base. His father Ahaz had been an extremely evil king and had destroyed any kind of worship of Yahweh. He'd set up idolatrous material throughout of Israel and he'd led the whole nation into idolatry. So Hezekiah really was, he was handed a mess when he took over as king and he had to now restore the right worship of God. And so there are these three stages that we see in his revival. Stage number one was the gathering of church leaders together. Um, and we're going to see a theme running through all of these three stages that he went through, which is the theme of my devotion today, that the physical gathering of believers together is central to revival. The physical gathering of believers together is central to revival. The first group he gathers together physically are the Levites, the priests. And he, he stirs them up to be diligent again to their work of cleansing the temple and getting ready to play the part of the priests as they did in the worship of Yahweh. Of course, he could not bring all of the people of his kingdom in and bring them to Jerusalem. And if the temple hadn't been restored and cleansed and the normal rites and rituals had been reestablished. So he starts with the priests, with the ministers. And this, of course, I think is, is something that we can do today. If we are wanting our generation to see revival, it must start in the church and with her leaders. There must be a gathering of godly Christian ministers who are recommitting themselves to the preaching of the gospel and to the, the building up of the church. Um, this, of course, can be true of a local church. So physically gathering the elders together to worship together, to repent of sin together, to seek God, to pray together, gathering the elders of a church. It could be kind of um, denominational wide. It could be a city wide. It could be a, a preacher's fraternal in an area. But the gathering of ministers together to pray, to repent, to seek God is the first step. Secondly, Hezekiah then gathers the leaders of the people. So these were not necessarily religious leaders, but the elders of the people, leaders of the tribes, uh, judges, people of that nature, people who were influential in the kingdom. He gathers the influences and they have this whole season of religious meetings, of singing worship to God, of preaching, of prayer and of stirring up the leaders. So is there some wisdom in that? We gather those who are influential in the community and we make sure that they are all committed to the Lord and that they are freshly inspired or rebuked or prayed for or prophesied over and stirred up for a great work of revival, which we see coming. So the ministers meet and are stirred. Then the influences are gathered and are stirred. And then finally, um, Hezekiah then sends his messengers out. Now the, the, the path has been laid. The, the building stones have been laid in place, almost like foundation stones have been laid in place upon which a revival can now be built. Because there is a core of, of ministers and a core of leaders who are all pulling together. And now he sends out the messengers of the gospel as they go out throughout the kingdom. And they are calling people back to Yahweh to come and celebrate the Passover. And this is what I've written here. Then the, the gathering of the masses, which is the gathering of anyone who will answer the general and public call to come and worship. This allows for all of the things we see him do when they are all now. All of the people are coming throughout the kingdom. They come to Jerusalem. What does he do with them? Well, there's a number of things we see. Number one, the public preaching of the gospel and the teaching of God's word. Let's read from verse 21 of chapter 30. 
So the children of Israel who were present at Jerusalem kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with great gladness. And the Levites and the priests praised the Lord day by day, singing to the Lord, accompanied by loud instruments. And Hezekiah gave encouragement to all the Levites who taught the good knowledge of the Lord. They taught and they ate throughout the feast seven days, offering peace offerings and making confession to the Lord God of their father. So there's this public group communal confession of sin. Then the whole assembly agreed to keep the feast another seven days and they kept it another seven days with gladness. And then he gives a whole bunch of bulls and sheep, thousands of animals, which they're sacrificing as they celebrate the Passover feast together. And then uh, verse 27, then the priests, the Levites arose and blessed the people and their voice was heard and their prayer came up to his holy dwelling place to heaven. <clears throat> so a, a number of things we're seeing happen in this massive revival meeting. We may call it. We, we see the, the public preaching and, and teaching of the word. We see the Passover celebrated. In our case, this is the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper has replaced the Passover. When we share the bread and wine, it is a communal moment. And it has always actually played a part in revival meetings, the celebration of communion together. Um, this gathering of the, the great mass of people together in meetings. The other thing that it allows is for public communal singing, as we see them doing. The singing of God's praises together as a group is part of revival. Um, and then we saw in, in the verses that I read to you, public teaching and then corporate prayer and then the blessing of the ministers over the people. They actually blessed the people probably with that blessing of Aaron. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you. And they are praying for the people. And, you know, I'm, I'm rambling through this, but I am foreseeing a day of revival where we are in a day of spiritual apathy, spiritual deadness, where I am so longing for there to be a season like this. And could this be a model gathering first those who are in the ministry to seek God, to confess sin together, to pray God, to seek him, then reaching influences, gathering influences together and calling them back to make God and Jesus Christ their first and primary concern, their most important priority and to use their influence for the glory of God as they should do and their money to, to promote the gospel and then a gathering of as many people as will come. And I, I long for God to accept the offering that we bring him in meetings of that nature as he pours out his spirit upon us, because at the end of the day, if those meetings are only in word, then we are of most men the most pitiable. If it's, if it's only singing songs and preaching words, and there are not demonstrations of the spirit and of power, then as far as I'm concerned, we are of all men the most pitiable. Paul says that the kingdom of God is not in word only, but in power. And so all of this is is to that end that we might encounter God and that he might change our generation.